Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. It's hard to imagine that at one time, Shades Valley, the site of present-day Homewood and Mountain Brook, was difficult to get to. While Red Mountain is not that high of a mountain compared to mountains out west, the natural gaps in the mountain were inaccessible to transportation when Birmingham was founded in the late 1800s. Lone Pine Gap, where Vulcan is now, was also called the Pig Trail due to the trail's condition. The name alone should give you an idea of what travelers faced. You could get to Shades Valley by crossing to the east and west, but directly from Birmingham was almost impossible. Lone Pine Gap would eventually be lowered by 70 feet, opening Shades Valley to direct traffic and development by those looking to get away from the smoke and industry in Birmingham. I don't want to make it sound like nothing existed before the 20th century. The earliest known white people settled in 1817, followed by the Watkins family in the 1820s, the Browns in 1851, the Griffins in 1854, and the Shacklefords in 1855. Native Americans never lived in the valley, but they were the ones who gave it the name Shades. Ominous stories of people getting lost in the valley and a human skeleton found there gave it a certain mystique. Chickasaw Indians called it the Shades of Death, probably because of the dense dark forest and not because of the dead body. Native Americans would enter the valley, but they never settled there and preferred to travel on routes along the summit of Red Mountain and Shades Mountain. The valley did share some excitement at the end of the Civil War. In 1865, Union General James Wilson destroyed the Irondale Furnaces. He marched through the valley down what today is known as Oxmoor Road on his way to destroy the Confederate Iron Works at Oxmoor. When Lone Pine Gap was lowered and the roadbed improved after the turn of the century, it made it easier for motorized vehicles to enter Shades Valley. The Birmingham and Edgewood Electric Railway built a trolley line in 1909, which started at the end of the South Highlands Line, traveled over Red Mountain at Lone Pine Gap, and followed Central Avenue, Manhattan Street, and Broadway as it took passengers to the growing town of Edgewood. Farther down Broadway and Columbiana Road was an undeveloped part of the land that developers had their eyes on. Running along the base of Shades Mountain is the conveniently named Shades Creek, a tributary of the Coosa River. It would make an ideal location to create a lake. A proposal was made to create a lake five times the size of East Lake. East Lake and its surrounding park were the destination at the time for Birmingham citizens for day trips and entertainment. The Edgewood Country Club was established, and construction started on the clubhouse before the trolley car line was extended. The trolley line would continue from Shades Road, where it had ended, to somewhere around the intersection of present-day Lakeshore Drive and Columbiana Road. This location was out in the country, but it's less than half a mile from I-65 at the Wildwood exit today. One crusty old scoutmaster told me that when he was a Boy Scout, they would take the trolley line from Birmingham to this location and then hike to a Boy Scout camp which was located on the lake across from Walmart on Highway 119 in Hoover. The camp would have been about six miles if the trail went straight, which I'm sure it didn't. Must have made for a good hike. The country club was built and membership sold, but the lake was still being planned. The original owner sold the club in 1914 to a group that included Charles Rice, a future Homewood mayor, and True Brazelton. They renamed it the Birmingham Motor and Country Club. Construction of the dam and clearing the lake bed began shortly after the purchase. In 1915, the lake was finally completed and stocked with bass and brim for the fishermen in the club. The lake covered over 117 acres and stretched from the dam to Highway 31. The original Highway 31 is not the four-lane highway that climbs out of the valley to Vestavia Hills today, but Old Montgomery Highway next to the National Guard Armory. What made this country club special was not just a clubhouse and a lake to go to out in the country, but developers planned a motor speedway. In 1914, automobiles were becoming increasingly advanced, and as any teenager will tell you, there's a need for speed. They had the cars, they just needed a place to race. Construction was started on a track that would circle the lake. Only the two straightaways would be graded for the track. Lakeshore Drive, which runs in front of Sanford University today, was the north side of the track. South Lakeshore Drive, which is obviously on the lake's south side, was the other straightaway. 
Today, Homewood High School and Brookdale University Park have divided the straightaway that is South Lakeshore Drive. The track was never completed, but if you look at a map, you can see the western curve listed as Old Green Springs Road connecting Lakeshore to South Lakeshore. The curve is also where the dam was built. In 1923, the Birmingham Motor and Country Club ceased operations. In the following year, the Cambram Grotto, one of the orders of the Masons, purchased the club as well as the Edgewood Amusement Company and the 414 acres surrounding it. The first thing they did was rebuild the dam that had washed away in a flood in 1923. The property was probably a great purchase for the Masons as they had a local membership of more than 8,000 and they needed a large place to accommodate their growing membership and provide them with a place to have events, barbecues, fishing, boating, and other activities. 8,000 is a lot of people, but they knew it could handle the crowd. Just the year before, in 1923, this little corner of Shades Valley hosted an infamous event that the Birmingham News said was attended by 25,000 people and would eventually have ramifications all the way to Washington, D.C. The Robert E. Lee Clan No. 1, the oldest and largest clan in Jefferson County, was established in 1916, less than a year after the clan was refounded at Stone Mountain, Georgia. The Klan denied any involvement in local violence and claimed to support public law enforcement. They were always ready to help keep the peace. Any reported violence that was blamed on the Klan was instead blamed on outside agitators. Sounds pretty familiar today. In an effort to improve their standing in the community, they would make donations to friendly pastors at churches around the city. And during their membership drives and initiations, they would turn it into community events. One such event happened on September 11, 1923, at Edgewood Park. Visitors streamed into Edgewood Park during the day to eat barbecue and picnic on the grounds by the dry lake bed. That afternoon, the aviator Glenn Messer performed stunts in the air above the crowd. He ended his performance by parachuting into the lake bed. When night came, the Klan initiated 1,250 members. 400 other candidates missed the initiation due to the congestion along the route through Edgewood. It was the largest event in the nation held by the Ku Klux Klan, and one of those initiates was a Birmingham lawyer named Hugo Black. There could be many reasons why someone would join the Klan. The main reason is that they are racist. The Klan was popular in 1923, and this might have been seen as an opportunity to meet new people, gain new clients, and increase business. I'm unsure which one it was for Hugo Black. He never said. It's probably a little of both if I had to guess. He did have sympathies with the Klan. A few years before joining, he had defended a Klansman in the murder of Father James Coyle, pastor of St. Paul's Cathedral, on the steps of his rectory. The judge and several jurors were members of the Klan, and using anti-Catholic biases to his advantage, Black would ask each prosecution witness the question, You're a Catholic, aren't you? His client was acquitted. Black had political aspirations and probably realized that the Klan could become a hindrance even then. He resigned from the Klan in 1925, just before he started his campaign for the United States Senate. He easily won and would go on to have a successful career in the Senate and became a strong supporter of Roosevelt's New Deal. So what we know so far is Hugo Black practicing law in Birmingham. He successfully defends a Klansman accused of murder and joins the Klan himself. He sees the light in 1925, resigns from the Klan, and embarks on a successful career in the U.S. Senate. By 1930, with the onset of the Depression and other factors, the Klan ceased to be a political force in Alabama and around the country for the time being. In 1937, Supreme Court Justice Willis Van Devanter retired, allowing FDR to appoint a justice. He had tried to pack the court with his own justices in the years before. It was unpopular and unsuccessful. He planned to have an FDR man on the court this time. Roosevelt nominated Hugo Black from Alabama, and the Senate confirmed him on August 17, 1937. The honeymoon lasted just a month when the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette published a series of articles about Black's involvement in the Ku Klux Klan. A former Klan leader had supplied documents to the Post-Gazette that were used to expose Black. If you remember, Black resigned his membership after only a couple of years before he embarked on his first Senate campaign. In one of the documents taken by a Klan stenographer, it was revealed that Black received a lifetime membership from the Klan in 1926 after he won the election to the Senate. In his speech at the meeting, he says, 
I realize that I was selected by men who believe in the principles that I have sought to advocate and which are the principles of this organization. There was outrage nationwide and calls came out for him to resign. Some said he traded his white robe for a black one. The Roosevelt administration was embarrassed, embarrassed that black had been in the Klan and that they did not do their due diligence when vetting their candidate. In a radio address to the nation, he admitted belonging to the Klan once, but abhorred racial and religious intolerance. Black refused to resign. Justice Black's influence on the Supreme Court is too vast to cover in this short story, but here are a few highlights. He wrote a majority opinion proclaiming a constitutional mandate for a wall of separation between church and state in Everson v. Board of Education. And he became hated by the segregationist who helped him get elected to the U.S. Senate when he became part of the unanimous opinion that outlawed racial segregation in Brown v. Board of Education. Hugo Black would serve as Justice of the Supreme Court until he resigned days before he died in 1971 at the age of 85. Today, nothing remains of Edgewood Lake besides a few concrete features that were once part of the dam. The site of the former lake bed is filled with soccer fields, business offices, a retirement community, and Homewood High School. Shades Creek meanders around the edge of the old lake, where once was a plan to create a track to race cars, the Lakeshore Trail draws a more sedate crowd of walkers, runners, and bikers. The clubhouse is long gone, as is the trolley. You would never know today that a Supreme Court justice's career was almost derailed because of what happened at this busy intersection. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Alabama Short Stories Podcast. You can continue to support the show by rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you haven't subscribed, do it so you don't miss an episode. You can also support the show by purchasing the companion book, Alabama Short Stories Volume 1, featuring the first three seasons of the podcast. You can purchase it at 